So, um, my name's Kevin Horlock, so I'm actually from Microsoft, so I'm here today in support with the guys of Incremental, and, and really what I want to try and do is try and express what is Dynamics 365, but also kind of take a step back and think about well, what is actually Microsoft getting involved in at the moment, because you may not fully appreciate everything that Microsoft is involved in, and it all overlaps now for us in terms of the world that we're in. And I want to just kind of try and share some of that and relate it to the Dynamics 365. I will focus on what you all think of as AX, but of course, and as uh, rightly highlighted, we have gone through a few name changes over the last couple of years. And as of July, it is now known Dynamics 365 for Finance and Operations Enterprise Edition. So it's a little bit longer than AX, but it does kind of bring together a little bit of a strategy and structure that we have that is occurring for us because we have two flavors nowadays for Dynamics 365. We have the Enterprise Edition, which is what it relates to us all today, but we're also bringing to market a, um, a, a small to business edition, one called the Business Edition, which has literally the same naming conventions across the board. So it kind of just brings everything together for us. Um, so although it's a very long title, it does kind of have a little bit of logic behind the scenes. Now for us at Microsoft, and you may have seen this particular um, statement. You know, we've had um, Satya Nadella as our lead now for I think about four years, and when he joined and took over the the mantle of um, of Microsoft, uh, he kind of set this in motion. And if anyone has here that is close to what has been occurring at Microsoft, there's been you know a lot of readjustment of how we are structured over the last couple of years. Um, historically, we would have been quite a um, I think monolithic is a bit harsh, but it, you know, we were very structured in certain areas and the teams weren't necessarily talking to one another. That's a very different situation now and we've continued to kind of evolve the business so that it is a case that everything we do is joined up. Um, and you know, we've just gone through um, a re reorganization internally, the biggest one ever within Microsoft. Uh, I don't know if you follow any of the press that's been occurring um, out there, but you know, the, you know, we now have one partner-centric organization rather than many, many, many partner organizations within Microsoft, which makes life a lot easier for everybody that engages. Because uh, we engage at many, many levels, of course. So this um, structure is behind us in everything that we are doing as an ethos. But when we then start to think about, well, how does that start to relate to us in our business world? We have to start thinking, well, what is the software? What is the technologies that we're applying this to? And that's where the, the the, the pillars around digital transformation start to come together. And on that diagram that's kind of moved across already for me, we're really kind of thinking about three things. We're talking about re, um, reinventing productivity, so we're looking at how we are all using applications on a regular basis. We're looking about how we are storing our data and where we are storing our data, and how we as individuals are all, are all engaging on a, you know, on a personal computing uh, level. I don't know how many of you have a mobile phone with you today, or many mobile phones with you today, but that's always quite a nice little example because you'll either have a couple of mobile devices, one you've kept personal, one that you have for work, or you may have merged the two, and you've got the applications and the security now in play on your devices in order to be able to work with your office domain to deal with your, your, your file footprint that you may have for, for Word, Excel, or any other applications all your emails, all on your personal mobile, which is what a lot of people have started to do. So we're just trying to bring everything together. So on this slide here, you've also got on the right-hand side a couple of thoughts, really. So what, what are we trying to get at? And there's three particular ones there. You know, what, is, what is a digital business? What is the business being, how is the business being transformed? And you know, how is the business model being digitally transformed? So there's a lot of different structures and a lot of different things that are occurring for us out there. Um, and that can, that can span every aspect. You know, I heard um, a few cases of where there was project management being applied, to HR was being engaged in terms of the functional footprints of what we thought of as part of the ERP suite. But nowadays, it's actually the broader sense of how we would maybe you know, locate those files and share those files across people in our domain or outside of our domain as well. So that you know, it can go off in a number of different directions when you start applying and thinking, how do I 
digitally transform my organization? How can I apply these kind of thought processes to what they are, are, are really sort of occurring? And when I think about what is occurring now for Microsoft and, and what we are offering the world, this, this slide here on the left is quite handy for me because, you know, the one area, that actually, can you spot the one area that's not up there that I'm not leading with today from a, from a business perspective? So we haven't got the gaming and the Xbox side of the business up there. Now, if that's remiss of me for excluding it to your worlds, I do apologise. You know, because I know in my little world, and it is a little bit crazy at times, you know, we do have Xboxes all through our corridors. You know, there are connects in stores for retail, monitoring what the footprint is of people as they go through a store. That all those sort of activities are there, but I haven't focused on them here. They're kind of merged behind the scenes. And on the left-hand side there, you can see we've got the modern workplace, the business applications, the applications and infrastructure through to data and AI. The data and AI piece, I'm not going to focus too much, but everything that I talk around today is really kind of leveraging that um, cloud environment that we have. You may have heard it in the press known as the Microsoft Cloud, and you, um, hopefully you would have seen some of the TV adverts that we've done over the years. Uh, the, the, the Lotus one is always the one that kind of comes to mind, or the Renault as it is today. But that cloud infrastructure is what we are now basing Dynamics 365 on. And on any aspect of Dynamics 365 is based on there as well. And there is scope to go on to other data centers as well. So it is a, a hybrid data offering. So that's we, we're one of the few providers that does enable that. So if you have invested with another um, a data center, that's absolutely fine. You know, we can share certain aspects of it. Some bits are per, you know, completely dependent upon it, like our AI work. Um, but there are areas of Dynamics 365 that we can spread out and, um, and, and work with people, because we do like to offer out the hybrid option um, of the cloud offering. But today, we're focusing around the business applications. Now, historically, we would have been thinking the word Dynamics that's the branding that we have always sort of led with in this area. But for us today, it's becoming broader than that, than just an ERP system or a CRM system. It is in effect becoming a suite, in effect, of business applications that we are all using. And that encompasses the Power BI's, that encompasses Office or aspects of Office like Word and Excel, etc. And when we then think about those business applications, and I think back to what I'm showing you on that slide, on the right-hand side, I then got to start thinking about how do we help people? How do we kind of engage that? You know, are any of you using Office 365 today? Have you kind of taken on board Office 365? Are, are any of you using kind of older editions, 2010, maybe earlier, of Office? So it's, it's okay. You know, someone's confessed a very old version of AX today, you know, that's very <coughs> brave. And it was, was um, so, you know, the older versions of Office is fine too. But when you're thinking about using Office products in the cloud, um, they are actually done very differently. Um, you know, the sharing, the collaboration of where your files are, how you work with other people is very different. It takes a little bit of getting used to when you've got a number of people working in a spreadsheet or a PowerPoint or a Word document together when suddenly something changes on screen in front of you. It's a little bit un uh, you know, unsettling uh, to begin with, but you are all collaborating, you are all working together, and you're seeing those changes come together live. But you can also kind of delve around, and that's also a power. I don't know if you guys have taken advantage of Delve within Office 365, but an area of where I take a lot of um, uh, time and, and spend a lot of time working is around the area of Delve where I can, you know, I might be stuck for a subject matter. As you can probably imagine, Microsoft being in a very large organization, if I want to know a particular topic, I know there is somebody in my organization that has that information. I will go and search via Delve and I'll get all the matches up across Microsoft, which often is quite a large number. But it does give me then scope to know what I need to find and how I can drill into somebody's you know, content that they've shared. You know, not everything is shared automatically. That's a choice that you have for your security. But you have the opportunity to be as collaborative as possible. And that's kind of an underpinning piece around Dynamics 365 um, and that we are wanting to be as productive as possible across everything that we're engaging. So when I come back to those four bo bo uh, boxes on the right-hand side, I've got the empower, I've got the engage, I've got the optimize, and I've got the transform. 
at the moment, I'm thinking about people. I'm thinking about the employees, of how they are working, how they are engaging within your organisations. You know, if I can speed up somebody that is on the road, um, or that spends, I don't know how many hours a, an individual, as a, with an engineer or a salesperson might spend in their car, you know, say that's six hours. That's six hours potentially lost, especially as I think it's a bit illegal nowadays to be talking on the phone while travelling. So that's a little bit kind of a concern. You've got downtime all, all over the place. So you need to kind of augment that of how you can share and work collaboratively. How you engage with a customer is very different as well now. So, you know, have you heard of something called Buyer 2.0? Has this philosophy kind of uh, come across to you yet where, you know, when you want to look at something uh, or understand something, we all go to the internet. Obviously, I hope you're all using Bing your search engine. Uh, you get rewards now as well, which is good. You get little prizes as well, which is very handy. That's come out in the UK and I'm, I'm up to, I think I've got a five pound voucher now, so I'm doing quite well in a month and a half. But you guys, you know, you had that scope as well. And I'm digressing a little bit. But the, the key point here is with Bing, with the search engine, and you may obviously use another, you are actually going off and empowering yourselves to find information. And customers are doing that all the time. If they want to know a particular subject, where do we all go? We go to the internet, we search, we look for something, and that is an empowerment. So customers are going off in every sort of direction. So you need to be aware of that presence that you need to have in that world of the internet and other media forms as well that kind of um, exist. And once you've kind of enabled both your, your employees, once you've engaged with your customers in a hopefully a more productive way, that, in theory, should release capital into your organisation to start help, help you optimise what you're doing and help you perhaps transform and differentiate your organisations to kind of lead with perhaps a, a, a product portfolio that you couldn't before because you didn't have the manpower or you didn't have the financial resources because you were you know, losing time through those um, activities that were not perhaps as productive as they could have been. And this is what we're all trying to think about now within Microsoft, is how can we help our customers engage better with the suite of software that we provide and the infrastructure that we provide. We don't think of them so much as individuals anymore. And this is, this is the start point of it all. On the left-hand side, I'm hopefully you can relate to this particular slide, but this is, this is what's underpinning a lot of the activity that we've got going on with the Dynamics 365 suite. You know, we have um, a number of versions of um, CRM component parts that, we, that exist within the Microsoft portfolio. Historically, they've all been disconnected. Same with a lot of the functionality within the ERP space. They've all been disconnected. And then you overlay the fact that we have Office products and we have other tools for security and reporting on beyond that. They were all disconnected. Our philosophy is to try and bring all this together and I'll show you some of why that is happening and how that is happening at the moment because on the right hand side there you can see some of the headlines there around trying to make it as, as modular as possible so you have the elements that are appropriate. Um, there is a common data model aspect to it as well, and I'm going to expand a fair bit about that in just a moment. But this kind of enables us to kind of bring all of the applications that, at the end of the day, have to talk to each other into one solution. And by doing that, we then kind of take it to that point where there'll be particular areas of focus or systems of intelligence, as we like to think of them on. And this is what we tend to lead with. You know, the one we are focusing on today really is the one in the bottom right-hand corner. But you can see there's, a, there's five in total there across the board. And this is what we are leading with in terms of the systems of intelligence for the full finance and operations for the supply chain on the right-hand side. HR, and we do like name changing names, so HR is now talent, which is a separate item. Um, and we've worked hard with the LinkedIn side of the business now as well, because I'm sure you've all seen in the press, LinkedIn is part of the Microsoft portfolio now. We've brought those two parts together for um, um, uh, resource acquisition or talent acquisition as we tend to refer to it. So that piece is there together. Uh, LinkedIn also is connected to sales for um, um, you know, opportunity management and locating new potential customers out there in the world as well. So 
although LinkedIn's not focused up here, I'm just kind of bringing that element together because I'm trying to keep relating us back to different topics. But those are the systems of intelligence that we have today that kind of bring it all together. And these are all now talking and interacting um, at a base level. Um, and this slide here just kind of tries to bring aspects of it together. So this is the Dynamics 365 offering from Microsoft that we have today. And you can see here a number of headings. Really think of those headings as the modular areas that we are leading with, that you could, you know, if, it was if you were thinking from a pricing perspective, you could be leading about. Um, you know, you've got sales, customer service, field engineer, marketing, um, and project service automation, really. They were really coming from underneath the historical banner of CRM, but now they're kind of focusing on particular uh, verticals and particular strengths that each of them has. And then you've got the, the retail, the talent, and finance and operations. Historically, we would have thought of that as just AX, but now we are actually providing those as, as uh, modular items as well. So it gives us scope to kind of uh, provide solutions to whoever is appropriate. Retail, for instance, is an interesting one. You know, quite often we've got um, people coming to us now that saying, we'd like the retail offering that you have, but we don't want the rest which is entirely, you know, viable as a solution. You know, they like the retail solution that we have in terms of the cloud pause, uh, how, do we, how we manage a particular store, but they don't want the broader Dynamics 365 finance offering, et cetera, because they probably have already engaged and have got something that they've invested in that's appropriate. By taking this particular approach and taking the, the element out, we can now work with those potential customers that we couldn't have previously and give people the offering that they, they would like um, and require. Now this is the core. Now around it is, is the important pieces as well. So, you know, I've, I've kind of touched a little bit about, you know, some of the powers of the Office 365 that we have um, available to us today. And you can see here there's a number of other headings as well. And I know the guys are going to talk a lot more about Power BI, so I won't drill too deeply around that. But there's aspects here like the Power Apps and the Common Data Service on the right-hand side that's worth just exploring. Common Data Service, what am I really talking about there? Glue is the word that comes to my mind on a Tuesday morning at, at Aberdeen. Glue. We have all those modular areas, how do we enable data to flow? How do we enable areas to interact with one another? That is our tool set. So nowadays, those are not isolated um, data siloed applications. We can now enable data to flow through from, uh, where is it, sales on the top right hand corner over to uh, finance and operations. The scenario there is a is an example where I could be managing a prospect in sales. And from, from that area, I can then say, OK, that prospect <laughs> has an opportunity. I manage that opportunity. I identify our stock availability. We, ident we agree a price. We agree the, the quotation. And that's where the role in you know, the sales area finishes. The fulfillment of that uh, opportunity or that quotation, as it's now really become and converted across to a sales order, would occur within finance and operations. So that information is passed across. Finance and operations would manage the fulfillment of that order and all aspects that kind of go with that. Information can still flow back to sales. So, you know, if the customer or the salesman needs to kind of understand what has occurred, you know, have, has my order been fulfilled? Do I have the stock? What is the price? All those sort of queries that occur, that's all going to be available for us here now. And that is enabled by that little phrase in the bottom left-hand corner called the, the common data service. And that's one example. And we've provided it as a, a templated structure. So there'll be a number of templates that come from Microsoft. And there's no reason why you couldn't build your own templates if you're empowered in that way to take a, a template structure and connect data together. Because it is all following a single common data model that is kind of building underneath everything that is occurring for us here. The Microsoft Flow is an interesting one as well because we like to start taking advantage of um, workflow. Now, workflow exists within AX today, and I'm sure some of you are using to its full. Um, but when you need to go beyond a single 
historical application and think you need to go beyond and work across the modular areas of workflow, that is where Microsoft Flow can come into the form. You know, so I can start managing the flow of data in a different way. And, and the Flow is a tool that's not just specific to Dynamics 365 um, and us. You know, it, it, there are, you know, if you go and look on, on Bing and, and, and look on our site, you'll see that there is you know, connectors to all sorts of applications way beyond what Microsoft offer. And it just enables that flow of data to exist and go to wherever is appropriate. And you can build up quite visual flow charts of how you'd like that data to, to process through. Today, of course, I'm thinking, obviously, of the Dynamics 365, and I'm thinking of operations. And I'm thinking that it might be appropriate that, um, you know, that you know, when I run out of a particular stock, I want to send a notification to somebody um, in perhaps uh, marketing or field service for whatever reason that's outside of the scope of the norm. I have the opportunity to build a connector and work in that direction that will be appropriate. It all comes down to what your business need is, of course, but that engine is there for us to kind of connect those areas together. Power apps. Are any of your organisations using mobile devices and apps on mobile? So a couple of hands and stuff. For us, we're finding it's becoming a little bit more common across the portfolio of everything that we do. Um, and there are choices as to how deep you can go in terms of how you create a mobile app. Uh, and Power Apps is one of those tools that actually pretty much anyone in this room could use to create a mobile app. It's not intended for a developer. It is intended for someone that understands the business processes, understands the business flow, um, is familiar with the Microsoft environment like the traditionals, like of Outlook and, and emails, etc. And it can build an app that you can push out to an Android device or a, an Apple device, an iPhone, etc. accordingly. And it just enables us to offer that extra tier of um, extendability that is available now today without having to fall back on a, a deeper engineering level that uh, might still be appropriate. You know, there are still tools like Xamarin that you could also build a mobile app um, on as well. So there's tool sets out there that go way beyond but there are also tools that are available that can take us to a point where, uh, as an individual, we could perhaps create a, an application for us within our organisation. Intelligence is a big area for us as well um, today, especially about when we're thinking um, order fulfilment, uh, costings, etc needing to understand a better way of working. How could we potentially power an upsell environment to a customer based on a, you know, a range of seasonal factors and uh, market trends and you know, buying histories that they may have? Now, I as an individual can't follow the logic sometimes of seasonal fluctuations that occur or you know, what happens in the markets that are trends. But if you are clever enough and you can build an algorithm to understand what is appropriate to your, your sector and your industry, then you can apply that algorithm to how you might make recommendations or suggestions to people through the process of order processing or order fulfillment, etc. And for us, that all goes underneath the heading of the Cortana intelligence side of the coin. We have a, quite a large analytics suite that enables us to take full advantage of uh, um, the the analytical tools and the AI suites. And when I say Cortana, I'm sure you've all seen Cortana in the sense of a personal assistance that we provide on some of our, our apps and some of our devices. It kind of goes beyond that. It's broader. And it enables kind of the, it's kind of more of a heading for the analytical suite that we have. An example could be, um, you know, that there is a customer out there today that I'm conscious of that is, you know, whenever a customer buys goods from, um, from them, they have a telesales organisation in, in a sense, and it will upsell or make recommendations based on buying patterns and buying history immediately to that salesman. So it, it's, and of course, would be appropriate pricing promotions would go into there as well. There have been other examples as well around how it might be appropriate to, you know, manage, you know, the the container flow of goods from, say, China, and you know, there are tracking, there's the ability to potentially track those goods, and there might be a pattern that surfaces because of 
you know, customs and excise delays that, is a, that happens at certain times of the year. So that can be factored into lead times, etc. as well. You know, it, it's one of those areas, if you can visualise an area, if you can identify where there is a bottleneck in your processes, then you can apply this suite and apply it into the Dynamics 365 side of things. I started to start to think a little bit about the Azure IoT there as well. Um, and have we, any of you kind of started thinking about devices in your home that you control via your mobile phone? Have you started going with home devices? The uh, thermostats of houses are quite, on, on your house is quite a popular one. Uh, I've still got mine in the box for about a year. I've still got to deploy it. Um, but there's also, you know, you can do a little fridges nowadays. You can scarily look inside your fridge with a webcam. I haven't quite got my head around that one yet, but you have the scope to kind of on your phone look in to your fridge to see, you know, how bad it is, um, it may be, or how full. You have the scope to look at it, but you also have the scope to track things. You have the, tra the scope to identify, you know, um, what is occurring from a retail perspective, what is happening from a container's location, what is happening as people walk into a room. Um, there's technologies like beacons that you can apply. Um, you know, I, we could have put some beacons in the room here today, for instance, and then as you walked in the door, it could have pushed a welcome to you on your, on your mobile device, just to welcome, you know, and that sort of thing is occurring on a broader sense. You know, the, the tracking of everything that is occurring in our day-to-day -day lives is, 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 is quite, um, quite exhausting, really, when you think about the permutations of where we can actually source data. Uh, but we can take advantage of that big data, as it used to be called, and, and apply it to our organization. So if there are particular patterns, if there are particular areas of, um, uh, of devices and, and um, you know, and retail is one of those areas that just naturally jumps to me personally because I can just visualize, you know, how I could go into a store and, and be tracked around a store. Um, but it could also be occurring in a warehouse. It could also be occurring, you know, um, on, a, on, a, on a building site and we're needing to keep track of certain products, certain items, etc. And I know there's a couple of you uh, in, in the re using rental as well. You could be tracking those particular items, whatever you have in terms of the, in, in, your, in your rental side of things. So all these areas are available to us today. And I've kind of been talking a little bit about it from a perspective of, you know, if you have the abilities, great, you can go and create your own. When I was thinking about the Power Apps side of things. There is an area now called AppSource that we are seeing, you know, it's, it's basically our library, our portfolio, what people have done in this area. When they've created something, they've thought, I know, we can take our organization because we are digiti digitality, can't say it, we are going through digital transformation and we have, we've identified that, you know, this app is not just applicable to us, we could make it available to others. We have created IP, uh, you know, the intellectual property of something. You know, a great example is, you know, when you go through training, I think someone said they were going through retraining soon, you know, they'll build up and perhaps a new portfolio of how they do their business processes. If you haven't already, I'm sure you have already. But that's their IP. When you're thinking about digital transformation, that is something that you could also resell and generate a new revenue stream from. And those are just kind of broad examples, but it could hopefully enables you to start thinking about how data could start to be engaging. Underpinning all this, just changing thoughts a little bit, because I'm, I'm remembering back to a few of you talking about, interested in knowing about how upgrades, et cetera, are occurring. Have you heard of something that we call lifecycle services? Is this an engine that rings any bells? Because um, I, I, I noted, you know, we've got a mixture of R2s and 2009s, et cetera, here. So you guys probably haven't come across it, but the R3 customers should have kind of, at some point, perhaps heard of or seen sight of, because that's when it started making its uh, introduction to life in the world of Microsoft. Under R3, it wasn't mandatory. It is something that was optional. Um, but with Dynamics 365, it is our, our only platform for delivering the suite for the finance and operations side. To explain what it is, it's, there's two aspects to it, really. The, it's the, the project management. It's the collaboration area for yourself and, and working with, say, incremental. But it's also how you manage your environments 
It's also how you manage your customizations. It's also how you manage your upgrades. Upgrades, whether it be the, the data or any of the customization upgrades that may be occurring. Within this tool called Lifecycle Services, we've providing, provided sorry, um, two, two routes, one for the 2009 customer base and one for the R3 customer base for migration of um, your entities or your, your data. It's a process to go through um, and it, we've streamlined it as best as we can to try and make it as effective as possible. I think the question mark will always come down to two aspects. Um, volume of data that you want to keep. And has your coding structures changed now that you're going to a new solution? Because you have the opportunity to revisit and rethink, is it still appropriate how we may have coded our chart of accounts? But it's also you know, how heavily customized is your environments as well. If you've gone to um, quite one of the earlier editions of AX, you know, there would have been the opportunity to do an awful lot of customization. A lot of customization areas that were originally done have now become standard functionality from around the R3 later stages. So it may be that what was customized isn't appropriate anymore because it's now there as a standard suite, or a standard set of functionality within the suite. So those are the kind of like two considerations I'd kind of just throw into the, into the mix of thinking around. But to recap, lifecycle services, and you can do LCS, or, or just put in lifecycle services into the browser, and it will take you to lcs.dynamics.com, and you can go and explore and, and, and kind of build your own knowledge of how and what it is all around. It's out there in the public domain. Move my mouse off. So, kind of underpinning all this is this this philosophy that all I've just been discussing and highlighting around is that we've got those four headings really: the purpose built, it's productive, it's intelligent, it's adaptable. You know, we are looking to provide that purpose built environment that we all familiar familiarise ourselves with, and I'll I'll bring up some of the applications in a moment. You know, we're trying to bring the familiarity of the tools together to make us all as productive as possible. And I've touched on that in a number of veins as we've been discussing. Utilising the built-in intelligence and making it as, an, as adaptable as possible. But when I then kind of think about the deeper side, and this is not to scare you, but this is just kind of put a little bit of context around what I was talking around when I touched on the words common data model and common data services. You know, Microsoft 365, which is you know, the, uh, the, the reorganized Office 365 from July, uh, LinkedIn, Dynamics 365, you know, those entities, how that data was all interacting is key. And we're interacting and engaging, utilizing the tools that you're seeing across the bottom. And, and I haven't touched on bots, but there's the scope for um, interacting with a bot um, as well. Are you familiar with what a bot is? Kind of ringing some bells, some nods, yes, no's. No, so Cortana as a front end would have been a, a bot, you know, something that I would engage with. The most kind of commonplace uh, I tend to see bots in a large scale is perhaps in Skype. And I'm, I'm thinking Skype as an individual. So if you use Skype at home to, to talk to your friends and family, you know, there's a category on there for bots. And there's a bot for Sky Sports, there's a bot for the news and so forth. And they'll interact with you and you can post questions to these bots. And based on what you type, they learn, they engage, and they have a knowledge library behind them, and they can send the information back to you. And then they can be a little bit friendlier. Um, they, you, they can also go very, to a very clever level as well, and that's an area that we are kind of pushing. The algorithms of behavior that is occurring behind the scenes is, is a science in itself. And there are different types that we can, can engage in. But I'm digressing a little bit because I just wanted to cover off that word in a little bit more detail. But all of that data that we're seeing it, that's interacting today has to, has to flow through our organization. And when I think about the flow through our organization, I'm thinking about, you know, where does data start? It starts with marketing, really. You know, we're out canvassing for um, potential leads. We're, we're kind of positioning ourselves as an organization. We then need to be kind of thinking about how do we kind of take that information that we're pushing out to the world 
um, and hopefully generating interest that we hope turns into leads that we then hope then converts to our sales team as qualified leads that we can then take to that next tier because those salespeople are out and about and so we perhaps need to provide a mobile device application so that you know a new lead comes in we like to differentiate ourselves by responding as soon as something comes in off the website or someone has phoned we like to ensure that those leads are qualified and we like to ensure that the the leads and the opportunity is managed and the quality goes up all the time and then when that quality of that lead converts to a quotation and then hopefully it becomes an order it's then considering how do we fulfill it and so when we're thinking about the management of that order we then have to consider how we would flow that data through the organization so that 360 view I think it's referred to as it needs to be visible to the people that are working and then we might need to optimize it so taking on board those thoughts I was trying to share earlier around how we might manage our container stock um, um, ensure it goes through customs and excise in the most expedient way uh, we want to be as intelligent as we can be through the process at times of course you know a standard flow that we have with our application suite doesn't always fit you know we need to provide you know, extensions, ways of working in a slightly different manner. Well, the Power Apps was the example that I was using earlier that we, can't, we could perhaps use as a way of saying, however we may be picking our goods or managing the workflow or maybe doing um, the goods in process is, is done slightly differently to how, you know, operations would like us to work. Therefore, we've got an app that we can put on the front end to, to work in a different manner. <coughs> Okay, the goods have gone to a customer, great. Now we're now starting to think about the, the customer services. How do we kind of support those customers? It might be something rather large, a high value item that involves engineers' time, etc. We need to be available as an agent behind the scenes. They need to have you know, access to all the, the knowledge um, libraries that might be appropriate to those engineers, whether it be internally and externally. You know, um, and you may have seen um, the augmented reality side of things kind of surfacing nowadays as well. Um, have you seen things like HoloLens? Have you, have you kind of explored any of this sort of things where you know, we can overlay a digital world on top of what we all see in front of us? Um, and I haven't put a video up to show you this, but you know, obviously pop to the internet and put Microsoft HoloLens in, and you'll see engineers um, being instructed on how to perhaps change a, a fuse or a socket or a pipe guided over the phone but they're, they're having a projection over, their, over this headset into the world that they're at at that point in time and it's good, you know, the, the, the range of examples is, is, is quite diverse there but as a service engineer it's quite potent. We then like to try and track the satisfaction, the customer engagement levels. So all this kind of flow that is occurring here on this, this rather detailed slide is just bringing together hopefully all the different points that I was trying to draw upon um, earlier that is Dynamics 365, which brings us back to the flow that you're seeing here now. And then when I think about the component parts that kind of support it, that, the, that are now part of it, you can see it's not really thinking in the sense of individual applications it is thinking as a solution and the parts of that solution of how they all interact taking advantage of that common data service through to the apps through to the power bi and so on well as a user i start to see it in this sort of vein so this is my kind of my initial sort of landing page that i have um, and those of you using office 365 will recognize the left hand side of my screen so on the left hand side there you can just about see the various um, apps that I have within Office 365 and Finance and Operations is one of them, um, Lifecycle Services will be in there as well. But I basically can click on and go through to the customer success, um, sales, customer service, those are all my, all my individual apps that I have access to. If I wanted to sign a focus in on um, operations as it is today, this is what a normal user would see. This is the, kind of the, in the initial default dashboard. And from this dashboard perspective, we can see here that you know, the little circular areas, if I draw your eyes to the bank management on the top left-hand corner next to the calendar, that is a, what we refer to as a workspace. 
which really is the involvement of what was once the role centres that we had, but in a slightly different manner and a slightly different range of focus of, of role. In terms of the UI experience here, though this is now designed to not just be keyboard entry and mouse entry, but it's all touch orientated as well. Um, words like HTML5, so if you're into development, you know that, what that language word will mean as in terms of environment. You, this is all based on HTML5 as the UI front end design. So we can scale up and down inside our browser. It is purely browser based, by the way. There's not a thick client approach to this anymore which is what we've had with the R freeze and earlier. So we can search around. And if I was to then click into one of these workspaces, this is, this is the approach that we now see. And it's always predominantly structured so that on the left-hand side, we have those um, KPI boxes. Um, those are kind of quick click-throughs to those particular areas and those particular lists. But you can see immediately there's a quick snapshot in terms of the summary form of, you know, um, open cases, etc. And then visually you can see the balances there. In the towards the top left hand corner, this is this is my my workspace. But there's also an analytical view to this as well. Because we can be already always thinking about how we would work with the likes of Power BI. And Power BI we can work in a number of different ways, but this is the the analytical workspace that now exists within operations. So this is from the Power BI side of the coin, taking the information, presenting it to individuals, that, that, and information that is pertinent to that workspace and that person's role. Role security, et cetera, of course, is still very, very pertinent to all of this behind the scenes. But when I'm thinking about how I'm looking at data, you know, it might not be appropriate to kind of keep looking at data from within you know, the, um, the, fina the finance and operations, uh, user experience, and the workspaces. Why go there when you spend your life in perhaps the, um, the BI environment, business intelligence environments? And so Power BI, and you'll hear more about this as we go um, today, gives you the scope to kind of just look directly at your data. And I'm sure Ken will be kind of dazzling us appropriately in a moment on that side. But I mustn't forget the power of the Excel, and we've kind of reinvented and reworked a lot of how the data is integrated with Excel so that we can kind of take full advantage of that particular platform. And of course, once you've got your data in, you can pivot off and you can restructure, and I'm sure you've done these sort of things before yourselves. But it gives you that sort of scope to kind of take full advantage of um, data from a within the user experience, taking full advantage of the, the charting capability that exists there today with the Power BI or the, uh, or the analytics workspaces. But you've also got, mustn't forget, Excel, how we could be interacting with Excel as well. But there's also, you know, personalizing and in trying to be as productive as possible within our user experience. And this perhaps goes a little bit overboard a little bit, but as an example, but what I want to just draw your attention to is you can see, say, on this vendor payments item here, we've got vendor pay run, not posted, quantity of six. Well, really, that's a shortcut through that I can click on now, rather than perhaps having to go onto vendor payments, locate, and then click through. So it kind of just helps speed me up. So this is my default dashboard, and you can see here all the items that might be pertinent to me I've put these little shortcuts in here. So under, towards the middle here on the right, sales order processing and inquiry, we've got unconfirmed delayed order lines, partially shipped. I could click through each of those to that information. So it just kind of speeds us up. Subtle, a little bit of personalization, but it kind of enables us to take us to that next tier. We've also kind of taken areas like the task recorder. Uh, which is still, still there and pertinent. But we've now got something called task guides that takes it to that next level. And this is here on the right-hand side, uh, a task guide that's being created that's highlighting us to say, create sales order invoices. And you can just about see that um, black and gray box by its side. Against the point here, you can see go to accounts. There's a little blue dot against 1.1. And that's the position I am on that particular task guide as a user. The power of this is when you think about new employees joining your organization. They've joined your organization. 
you've invested in them, you've taken them through training, and then we all know that day will arrive and they've got to do it themselves. Did they pay attention to all of that training? Hands up that spe spent every minute of their course paying full attention. We all drift off, don't we? I do. Should I admit that on camera? I don't know. But it is a case that we lose track. And when that, that, when that moment comes and we've got to do that task for that very first time, it's a little bit daunting, even if you've got the manual on the paperwork. But if you can put in, how do I create a sales order? Into the search bar at the top right, it'll pop up this uh, window and it will guide you through the steps. So I'm at 1.1 and from here I can click again and it, from, I've clicked on go to accounts, orders receivable, shipped, takes me into that part of the UI, the box moves with me and will continue through each of the individual steps appropriately, guiding me through the particular task, helping that new employee understand that, that task that they learned two weeks ago, three weeks ago, for the very first time. Are, is there anybody here from a retail perspective? I know I was talking to somebody from Incremental about a retail customer, I'm not sure if they were here, but I did just pop up um, the UI that is here for the tills as well, just to give you a sense that is um, from, the, from, from that perspective of the, the, the Cloud Pods side. Now from here, you know, this is, you can see the nice great big boxes, as you could <coughs> imagine, from a till perspective, these are basically touchscreen orientated controls. So it's intended to be as visual and as you know, in your face about how you would approach a particular task, like a current transaction. So in terms of essence, what, what has kind of happened here for us over the last few years? You know, from a Microsoft perspective and Dynamics 365, as we've been investing through the various product names and what we've kind of standardized on now, you know, we started this as a strategy thinking out there in the mobile first, cloud first world. And that's how we were leading how we were thinking. But the world continued to evolve and grow, hasn't it? And we've kind of seen a lot of shift and change around that. And, and really, realistically, that doesn't really cover it anymore. It really has to kind of think in this sort of sense as to how we bring all the aspects and all the ideas and all the thoughts that I hope to try and share with you this morning um, out there from the Dynamics 365 portfolio. The in intelligent cloud and those little icons are trying to reflect all the engagements that we have from a data perspective that is occurring. You know, we have the, the Microsoft Cloud that all this is being managed and based upon. We have the business applications that we're all interacting with. We have the tools to interact with our customers or our staff through whatever device that might be appropriate. So we have the intelligent cloud taking full advantage of whatever device it may be, whatever technology. Hopefully we're taking full advantage of the developments that are starting to occur in the, the artificial intelligence side of things. That, I think, pretty much brings me to the full around what is Dynamics 365 and what we're trying to do and how we're bringing everything together, which I hope has made a lot of sense, fingers crossed, and follows through. So I'm here for the morning. If there's any further questions, happy to help with the lunch.